as we begin this fast, one of the things we're praying for is the raising up and a releasing of leaders. Uh, that's what God has done with me and my wife. That's what God has done with many of you. He raised you up. You were headed for a ditch. Maybe you were in a ditch. Maybe you were a ditch. And he, and he saved us and he rescued us and he, my cup runneth over. How many, of your, how many of your cup runneth over as the psalmist said? Some of, you, some of you lost your cup. Some of you, your cup is chipped. We're praying for God to raise up an army, an army of leaders. And I'm so grateful uh, for Mayor Edna and Noel to be on the front row tonight because to me, it's a prophetic picture. Noel and Edna, you all are going to live forever. But I think it would be fair to say that maybe 50 years from now, you'd probably be in heaven should the Lord tarry. Would that be accurate? Most likely. Amen. I'd probably be with you. All right, then. So then the question is, Mayor, the question is, who's going to take your place? Who's going to take my place? One of the deaths of the American church has been pastors that get elevated, raised up, God's hands on them, they, 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 they lead the charge, and then it's time for them to pass the baton, but they grip onto that thing. Instead of like John the Baptist who says, I must decrease, he must increase, there's got to come another generation. There has to come a generation of new leaders. And I'm talking about your children. I'm perhaps I'm talking about you. I'm 55. I feel like I'm 25, but I am 55. And I am targeting 120 years of preaching, praying, and prophesying. Amen. Divine health. But as we begin our fast, one of the things I'm believing for is a bunch of Nehemiahs, a bunch of burning, shining lamps, John the Baptist. We must see an army rise up to bring reformation. I don't want a revival. I'm not looking for a revival. Most people think a revival is like a three-day meeting. A real, a real revival actually becomes a revolution. A real revival really, like the, the real ones, they go on and on for years, like a reformation, like in Martin Luther's day where he nailed the 95 Theses to the, to the doors of the church at Wormberg. And, and it confronted the religious leaders of the day. The church, the Catholic church was so powerful. You confronted them, they killed you. Oh, and they tried. But how many of you know you can't kill what God doesn't want killed? Nehemiah is an amazing picture of reformation. A leader. And so, as it says in Philippians 2 and 15, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and a perverse generation, among whom you shine like stars in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. Matthew 5 and 14, you're the light of the world. I want you to say, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Some of you, some of you, some of you need to turn the lights on. And then that's why you're here tonight, and I'm glad you are. Some of you are ashamed of the light. I remember talking to some college students not long ago, and they were making excuses or saying, you know, I don't mean to be hyper-spiritual when they were just talking about the things of the Lord. It so shocked me that I thought, hyper-spiritual? You're just talking about the Lord. What do you mean hyper-spiritual? We need a people that will rise to boldly declare the truths of God's word. Nehemiah 13, uh, really the whole book of Nehemiah is a family favorite of ours, and I've preached from it countless times. Can't remember all the times I've preached from it. But in Nehemiah 13, you see a blueprint, if you will. You see a, a framework of these four non-negotiable commands that Nehemiah gives the people of Israel. They said, you can't mess with these. 
They had drifted far. Israel was really in trouble. Nehemiah is the one that was burdened by the Lord when he heard the wall was broken down. And his story is quite amazing. We'll look at Nehemiah 13. I don't think I'm going to read it straight off as I usually do. We'll look at verses, sections of Nehemiah 13, the reforms, and then we're going to apply them with New Testament wisdom to our lives. Somebody say, well, the Old Testament is the Old Testament. We don't have to, listen, if you don't, you are ripping yourself off if you don't read the Old Testament and tie it into New Testament reality. The Old Testament is a picture book of New Testament reality or new, the Old Testament concealed, the New Testament revealed. So you, you, don't, you don't throw out the Old Testament by any means. Four commands that, that have got to be grasped. Let me give you uh, some uh, context here. Jeremiah prophesied, I'm writing your notes now, I believe. Jeremiah prophesied that Israel would go into captivity into Babylon for 70 years. And that is from, for you historians and note takers, and it's right there, 606 to 536 B.C would return to Jerusalem. And you can read that in Jeremiah 29. You're going off crazy Jerry. They threw him in a pit, tried to get him to shut up. But like a fire, shut up in my bones. Jeremiah, Jeremiah could not shut up. You can't shut up the word of God. And so because of their sin, they're going to be brought into captivity and they were going to go 700 miles from where Israel was to Babylon. And they would march Five months. Okay, they didn't get in the tube. They didn't get on a subway. They all didn't have chariots. They marched. They walked. Five months. People died on the way. It was a brutal time. Brutal. Five-month hike. 700 miles, they say. And they finally get there, and they spend 70 years. And guess what they have to do when they're released? Five-month hike home. See, we read things and we don't really understand some of the stuff that they went through. Isaiah prophesied that they would return and rebuild Jerusalem. You can see that in Isaiah 44. Persian king Cyrus, he's the only one called God's anointed that's a, a pagan. A Gentile is the only one called God's anointed. The only Gentile that's called God's anointed Cyrus. And Isaiah 44, 28. And... Building the temple complex included building infrastructure to mobilize everything that was involved. They not only needed to build the temple, they needed to restore the priesthood, they needed to get the doorkeepers, they needed to, they, they needed to get incense and perfumers and everything that, everything that provided for worship, they had to get everything together. So when we think, oh, they're just going to rebuild the temple, it's kind of like building our building. Is the building almost done? Yeah, almost done. It's all the other things that we have to do as well. And from God's point of view, the temple is a picture of the New Testament church today. Now, don't take that out of context. Of course, there's the prophecy of rebuilding the temple and so on and so forth. But the church is, as the Apostle Paul said in Corinthians, the temple of the Holy Spirit. After 70 years of captivity, God sent Israel back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city and the temple. And he uses two uh, leaders in a very special way, Zerubbabel and Nehemiah. Nehemiah is the one who rebuilt the wall in 52 days. He said it was impossible. And uh, Ezra is a contemporary of Nehemiah. How many of you heard of Ezra? The book of Ezra is a contemporary. They were homies. We're partners. Nehemiah's visit comes about 13 years uh, after Ezra and seven years after the temple is finished. So 70 years after the temple is finished, 445 BC, the walls are still not put in place and Israel is still in disarray. You know, it takes a long time to turn a nation around if people are stubborn and don't follow through but he can save a nation even in a day. And Zerubbabel and Nehemiah's reforms were built around his corporate worship center. And you can read all of this in Nehemiah 12. In Nehemiah chapter 8 through 12, 
is this whole story of really revival and how the nation makes this covenant and Ezra leads them and they make this covenant with God that they were going to serve him. And there's four things that they make a covenant with and we're going to look at those. And Nehemiah emphasizes these four areas and insists on them. And they sign, if you look at your notes, we're at, we're at that, the final point there before we'll look at the text. They sign this covenant that they're going to obey the word. And they have this massive party. I mean, it's this nationwide celebration. Woo! We're back on track with God. And Nehemiah goes back home, back to Persia. He was the cupbearer of the king. And it's a little bit hard to figure out how long he's gone some say 10 years, some say 12 years. You just have to try to study it and figure it out. 10, 12 years. I imagine him saying to Art, Artaxerxes, I think his name is, you know, I had an amazing time when I was back home. I was, had not been there in 10 plus years. Would you mind if I went back? Oh, go ahead, Nehemiah. Nehemiah heads back to find the entire nation in disarray, having broken every single one of the four areas that he emphasized. And there's other things, but four main non-negotiables. And I want to say this to you tonight and to all those online in this last Wednesday night, last Holy Ghost night, if we're going to see a reformation, if we're going to see a nation turn, if we're going to see our community turn, these four things are still the same. You can't change these. And if you do, you're in some deep trouble. These are, aren't they just negotiable? No, they're, they're not. God's word's not negotiable. So Nehemiah returns and confronts the people, and these are the four promises that they said they would fulfill, and it's the four things he confronts them on. Are you all there? Or look at the text. Nehemiah returns, and he confronts the people. And I, I want to say that if you're spirit-filled and you have full allegiance to the Lord, you will confront stuff. That is just how it goes. You say, well, I don't like confrontation. Well, if you don't like confrontation, then you're going to have the devil running things. I don't really like confrontation either, but I don't like the devil worse. And so I, I'm, I really don't like confrontation, but I cannot stand not confronting things. And the opposite of that, which is disarray and allowing the enemy to move into a church, move into a family, not coming in my family, not coming in this house. Come on, somebody. Now, you don't have to be a jerk about it, and I've, I'm improving on that. But it does require boldness. You can be kind, but it does require being bold. The first one, and you'll see this in Nehemiah 10, the whole, that whole story is basically from uh, Nehemiah 8 to Nehemiah 12, and they have this big celebration. Nehemiah 13 is Nehemiah's been gone for 10 to 12 years. He's come back to check on how everything is going, and it's not going well. And that's where he starts knocking some heads. And he does. He does knock heads. Reminds me of Jesus and the temple when he flips over the money-changing tables and he makes a whip. And he says, my house is a house of prayer, but you've been in the den of thieves. They promised not to marry unbelievers. Hmm. To uphold godly standards in the family. You can see this Nehemiah 10, 30. Nehemiah confronted the failure of them to keep God's order in marriage, God's family. He boldly confronts them. Let me read it to you. Nehemiah 13, verse 23. I saw Jews who had married women of Ashad, Ammon, and Moab. Listen closely. Half their children spoke the language of Ashad, and could not speak the language of Judah, which is what? Hebrew. Verse 25, I contend with them with, with them, and struck some of them, struck some of them, what it's slapped them, hit them, and pulled out their hair. And I made, yeah, this, this guy is serious. No mess with Nehemiah. Made some of them swear by God, saying, you shall not give your daughters and wives to their sons. Let me just say this. It's so important. Who you marry is absolutely crucial. And, and I could interview folks 
and tell you about the pain that they had because they went for the physique instead of godly character and integrity. They, they, they went for the all that. He used to have such a big, broad chest. Now he has chest of drawer disease. That's where his chest falls in his drawers. He confronts them. Because in marriage, if you're not equally yoked, now, this is a little bit different. There's, there's a, a, mixed, a mixed multitude and culture, and that, that's fine. But you must have, the, the spiritual application is, you must marry someone who loves God with all their heart. My, what, what, if I, what if I just got saved and my, my husband doesn't, my wife doesn't? Pray that they get, pray they find the Lord also. I mean, that's it, different. You got to redeem all of that. But if you're walking with the Lord and you love God with all your heart, don't do missionary dating. I did it with Pastor Karen. It worked out. We got blessed. <laughs> worked out for me anyway. Amen. But it's a bad idea. It's a very bad idea. And I want to tell you that even being unequally, low, unequally yoked, you can be unequally, uh, believers can be unequally yoked. And so what happens in, in this case, what happens if the children can't speak Hebrew? Guess what happens? They cannot learn the word of God. And if they don't learn the word, then what happens to that family? That family gets divided. That family gets led down a, a, the road of, of unbelief. And so he's, he freaks out. I mean, he strikes them and pulls their hair and says, you idiots. The fullness behind this unequally yoked thing is having family values. I'm going to preach a message called the Spirit-Filled Family. I tried to find something cute and millennial-like, but I can't, so I'm just going to call it the Spirit-Filled Family. How do you have a family that's Spirit-Filled? How does that happen like seven days a week? What does that look like? Because if you were just coming to church here and, and receiving that's wonderful. And you can receive life-changing messages and impartation. You get equipped and get trained. But you have to walk that out tomorrow morning, Thursday, Friday. You've got New Year's. Some of you, it's just pulling on you to go buy yourself something and get all hammered like you used to. Celebrate, celebrate your New Year. Remember those good old days? They weren't all that good, bro. See, when, when you don't have that right, when you, when you marry, when you yoke unequally, if you don't have that domino right, that domino can fall and many things fall in line after that. You have to have that right. What happens if I thought I was equally yoked and we move on down the line and they, they turned away? That happens. And I don't, I don't understand that. You just pray your ears off, do your best. Live at peace with one another if, if they're willing to, says the word. And maybe through your good conduct, ma'am, sir, you can win your spouse back. Get on fire. Get full of the Spirit of God. Love God. Serve them. Be like Jesus. Don't be like Jezebel. Be like Jesus. You miss a great place to say amen. And Jezebel's not just women. It's also men. Don't be an Ahab. Be Christ-like. Win your spouse back. Win your children back. And, and the picture is, you know, when they, they don't speak Hebrew, so they're not learning the word. It's a picture like, they don't go to church. Let's think about it that way. They don't learn God's word. They don't read God's word. They don't memorize God's word. Your children, you are the number one discipler of your children. Oh, you can look to us to do it here at the church, at church leadership, and we will do our level best. But if it's not enforced at home and modeled out, I don't, listen, your kids will do what you do, not what you say. Oh, you might be able to control them in the house, but afterwards when they get out, Mr. Helicopter, parent, they might just blow up everywhere if you don't do it right. So he comes and he confronts them. Wow. The second confrontation is to keep the Sabbath. You'll see this in Nehemiah 13, verse 15. He says, I saw the people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath. Verse 16, men of Tyre brought fish, brought in fish and all kinds of goods and sold them on the Sabbath to the children of Judah. Verse 17, when I contended with the nobles of Judah and said, what evil thing 
this is that you do. Verse 18, did not your fathers do thus and did not our God bring all this disaster on this city? I mean, he's telling them, you see everything that's jacked up? It's because our fathers did the same things and you idiots are doing it too. And he's straight rebuking them. Listen, if you're going to have a reformation, you're going to have a, a, a real revival, it has to be lived out in your own life and has to be lovingly confronted in the polls. It has to be lovingly confronted in the schools. I was talking to a substitute teacher and they were telling me that what's crazy is as they're in the schools as a substitute teacher, they see that very few high school kids are willing to stand up for what they believe. Everybody just wants to hold their head down and just be like, man, I just don't want to get in trouble. You know something? The kind of trouble that Nehemiah's in, I like that kind of trouble. Oh, we're not going to pull people's hair, but we are spiritually. Amen. <laughs> you need to be filled with the love of God. But I'm going to say, one of the things that, really, that I really disliked about Christianity is because I didn't see it modeled. I thought that Christianity was like, before I was saved and before I knew better, so don't judge me. I'm just saying, I thought, I thought all Christian men were sissies, bro. Oh, you just need to be a nice guy. Well, I want to tell you something. I'm nice, kind of. I'm also spiritually violent. I'm going to stand on what the right thing is. If you don't like it, too bad. I don't, I don't. How many of you want to just be a nice guy? Raise your hand all the night. Don't raise your hand. I want to be a godly man. I want to be a spirit-filled man. I want to be a man that confronts things and deals with things with the love and the attitude of Christ. Now, I can be a jerk. Not half as bad as some of you, but I can. I can be difficult. I, that's the flesh. We need Christian men that'll stand up for what's right. And if you get pushed back, you crumble like a reed. And we need Christian women to do the same thing. I was turned off by the pansified Christianity when I first heard about it. So does everybody just nice and just carry your Bible? Well, praise the Lord. Praise God. Okay, maybe that's just me. He confronts them about not keeping the Sabbath. You know, not keeping the Sabbath, it's, 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 the Sabbath is not a day for snow machining. Oh, you thought it was funny until now, right? The Sabbath is not a day for skiing and recreation. That's not what the Sabbath is. You start studying, the Sabbath is not a specific day. In the New Testament, someone would say, well, it has to be on Friday night to Saturday night. So, no, it doesn't. Yeah, that's when Jews celebrated it, and that was the Sabbath for them. But the Sabbath in Christ is every day. But you should have one in seven. Everybody say one in seven. One in seven where you put aside your phone. I'm being convicted right now. You put aside some things and plug in with God and get refreshed and, and, and worship Him. And, and for many people, it's Sunday. Sunday is a very big work day for us here on the staff at the church. Yeah. It's not really my Sabbath rest. I'm trying to enable and trying to rest in Christ every day. But there should come one in seven where you disconnect and you don't. I'm getting convicted. Is anybody else getting convicted? Maybe we should repent. Oops. I have sections of Sabbath rest throughout the week. No. It doesn't say that. And there is a legalism. There's many people that are legalistic about it. But you have to plug in. And you have to get refreshed with the Lord. And refreshed with your family. And you just have to get refreshed in God. But it's not about, how many of you know you can take a vacation and come back and need a vacation from your stinking vacation? Some of you are so tired. You're like, I just got to get the right vitamins. I'm all for vitamin D, especially now. But you can take all kinds of vitamins and still feel weary. There's a spiritual refreshing that comes from the Lord. And so Nehemiah deals with them and he's rebuking them. Verse 20, now the merchants, it's Nehemiah 13, verse 20. Now the merchants and the sellers of all kinds of wares lodged outside Jerusalem 
once or twice. Verse 21, I warned them and said, why do you spend the night outside the wall? If you do it again, I'll lay hands on you. <laughs> I like Nehemiah. That's not the kind of hands that we just, that's not the kind of laying out of hands that we just did. It's, it's a straight bodily harm threat. And I get the, I mean, we don't have a picture of Nehemiah, but it's just like, you know, this is a long time ago. But I get the, I get the picture that like, you know, he's probably like 6'3", 250, big gnarly beard. You do it again? I'm going to lay hands on you. And it's kind of like, what did you see? He pulled those guys' hair out. I'm like, we, we better get out of here. People walking around town with patches gone from their hair. It's a revival. <laughs> Nehemiah. It's a Nehemiah anointing. Look at three. They committed to giving. This is Nehemiah 13.10. Now, I, I know this might be a shocker to some of you. The lights in this building do not stay on because we have right relationship with the Lord. <laughs> how many of you know? How many of you know we also have a light bill? Okay, how many of you know we have a gas bill? We have a water bill here, but at our new property, we won't. We supply all our own water. There's septic costs. Did you know that? Sewage. Some of you are connected to city sewer. We're not connected to city sewer at our property. We have our own septic treatment plan. Come on, somebody say hallelujah. It can handle seven to 8,000 people a weekend. You can have that many? Well, yeah, sure. Really? Yes. It's going to be awesome. Come on, raise your hands. Come on, that's a lot of toilet paper. Hey! Do you know the revival in Brownsville? Did you know their toilet paper bill I read somewhere was like $11,000? That's like back in the 90s. 11 grand, or maybe it was seven, whatever. Seven, 11, it's a lot of toilet paper. <laughs> Nehemiah confronts them over their lack. They're not, they're not tithing. They stop tithing. Look, look at this, Nehemiah 13. I also realized that the portions for the Levites had not been given to them is Nehemiah 13, 10. For each of the Levites and the singers who did work had gone back to the field. You see, what happens is people stop giving, so the ministry can't move forward. And if the ministry's not moving forward, what's not happening? Worship's not happening. Prayer's not happening. The center of the community is, is broken down and destroyed. So I contended with the rulers and said, why is the house of God forsaken? I gathered them together and set them in their place. Then all of Judah brought the tithe. Wow. Nehemiah understood the importance of establishing prayer and the, the importance of having people in ministry. It's important. People in ministry in the marketplace, but people in ministry in the house of the Lord. I've got an amazing staff. I'm so blessed by that. And our staff is going to grow. It is? Well, yeah. We're going to be pastoring 10,000 people. We'll have a, a tithe of the community. That's what's going to happen. Somebody say a tithe of the community. 10,000 people, say it. How are you going to do that? We just keep growing at the rate we're at. We're out of room here, but we're going to move into this building. Can you say amen? amen? And we'll be able to do it there. It's so important to have the blessing of God on your life. And tithing is crucial. And really, really it's, I've heard one person say this, and I'm, I'm going to dive in and study some more. How many of you know you should never be done studying? Tithe and first fruits. And you say, well, tithe is, it's not the tithe in the New Testament. I had somebody tell you, it's not, it's not 10% in the New Testament. And usually when somebody tells me that, they're, they're, they rip God off and they want to argue about how it's not, you know, tithe. But instead, this person said, that, that would be like a bare minimum. No, no, I weigh over tithe, way more than tithe. I, I, I give in proportions. God gives me faith to give, but a tithe is like a, that's like a benchmark. I mean, I, you want to go over that. That would be a bare minimum. 
Come on, he owns it all. Say that. He owns it all. And number four, he's committed to not have, they committed to not have unholy alliances. Now, this is heavy because I've found that most people have this in business. They start businesses and their partners are pagan and don't believe like they do. So, well, then, then, I, then I shouldn't work for an unbeliever either. No, I didn't say that. I mean, we, we need to be with unbelievers. Why? Because we should minister to them, pull them out, and witness to them, share our faith with them, model what it is to have this amazing life. So it, it's, not, it's not that. But significant partnerships should not be, should not take place with someone who is not a believer. Look with me at Nehemiah 13, verse 4. Elishab, the priest, having authority over the storerooms. You know what the storerooms are? It's like the vault. It's where all the tithes and everything were stored. The storerooms of the house of God was allied with Tobiah, an Ammonite. Does anybody know who Tobiah is? Tobiah is the guy some 20 years before tried to kill Nehemiah. He's the arch enemy of, of Israel. So, so no longer are people tithing, so the storehouse is empty. They refurbish the vault and make it a condo. No, this is what happened. And the guy moves in. They move in this businessman to buy it. They move him in. And Nehemiah discovers it. Prepared a large room, verse 5, Nehemiah 13. He had prepared a large room where he had previously stored the tithes, which were commanded to be given to Levites and the singers. Verse 6. During all this, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Arxaxerxes, I had returned to the king. So he had been gone while this happened. He then goes on to say, verse 7, I came to Jerusalem, discovered the evil that Elishab had done for Tobiah. Verse 8. And it grieved me bitterly. Therefore, I threw all the household goods of Tobiah out of the room. Have you ever seen maybe, uh, maybe some of those videos where the boyfriend and the girlfriend uh, get in a fight? And then she opens up the windows and is throwing all of his stuff out into the street. How many of you ever seen that? Okay, that's what happened. Yeah, that's what happens. You're like, that's it. That's it. He opens the window and starts chucking the guy's stuff out of the storehouse where the tithe is supposed to be. I like Nehemiah. Does anybody else like him? You say, well, Tobiah, you know, he's a businessman. He was really supporting the ministry. You don't need that kind of support. You don't need the kind of support. I remember years ago, somebody tried to buy me off. I won't go all into the story just in case they happen to be online. But if you can be purchased, if there's a price, are there children here? If there's a price, then I, I think that that's prostitution, isn't it? Excuse me? So if you can be paid for, what, what is the price that you could be paid for? What would be the amount that you would then cave into? What would that amount be? Sure is quiet in this Methodist church. I don't know what power to buy ahead, but he had power to manipulate even the high priest, and he shut down the giving, and he moved into the he moved into the temple. Yeah, Tobiah in Nehemiah four with Sanballat. They were the ones that tried to stop Nehemiah, and here he is. Can you imagine whose stuff was this? Oh, Tobiah, you know the guy who told you to come off the wall? Tobiah, the guy that tried. I think he started to have a little bit of a, 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 a conniption. 
think that even might be Yiddish. He started throwing stuff out, and he, and he cleansed the place. Look, God's speaking to us very simply. These four things, the four things, are you ready? The four areas that you need to have in your life that we need to not only insist on in our own lives, but we need to model it and insist on it through legislation. And they're vast, really. Now, listen, you can marry an unbeliever if you want to. I'm just telling you, it's not going to work out very good. And you're not going to have a reformation if everybody decides to just have this hodgepodge. Well, there's equality, and everybody just, you know, it's just, you know, there's many ways. What, what are you reading? There's not many ways. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And there have been some that have taken that to mean racial things, and that's not what it means for us in the New Testament. That, I promise you. He promised not to marry unbeliever. I'll just tell you, don't marry unbelievers. And in the words of the New Testament, don't be unequally yoked in, in relationships and have the right order in your home. I'll let you know how to have right order in your home. Well, I'm going to preach a series on how to have that. So it's coming up. Keep coming. How to raise children. How to be a godly spouse. How to be a godly wife. How to be a godly husband how to be a spirit-filled family. These things are often not taught. We just think that we're just going to catch it. Osmosis, you know. We just catch it. Well, if you caught it from your parents, God bless you, that's awesome. But most of our families were jacked up. And even the ones that weren't jacked up were still jacked up. And then we try to take what was good and, and, and try to do better and, you know, jump from their shoulders and do the best we can. But many times there's not training on all of that. And then you wonder like why, why we have so many difficulties and challenges. Number two, keep the Sabbath. You must honor and have sacred time with God. If you don't, you're going to have a problem. Number three, be committed to tithe, be committed to give. And number four, don't have unholy alliances. If, you are, if you're a business owner, you're going to start a business, do not partner with somebody who doesn't believe in tithing, who doesn't believe in God. Yeah, but they're connected, man. Like God can't help you get connected some other way. We want to compromise? All right. God longs for his people to have the abundant life. We're, we're in, the, in the application here. God's speaking to us. God longs for you to have the abundant life. The abundant life doesn't just happen. You have, to, you have to violently take it. You have to see what God wants to give you. Then you have to lay hold of that promise and you have to claim it and wage a good warfare and move forward and change the way that you think. You must change the way you think. So God, listen, God's in a good mood. Someone say God's in a good mood. And he wants to help you, he wants to bless you, but he can't violate his own character. Commit to living a holy life. Say that. Commit to living a holy life. Live holy. Be a person of prayer. See, be a person of prayer. Nehemiah, you go look at his life. Go look at the whole book of Nehemiah. That beard pulling face slapping. That guy, his life is marked by prayer. He prayed. Prayed for strategy. He prayed for favor. He prayed, he prayed, he prayed, he prayed. You know, if you'll pray continually, you'll have continual releases of God's power in your life. If you don't have a prayer life, you say, well, how do I start it? I'll tell you how. Pick a time. And I would say in the morning, pick a time in the morning. Get your carcass out of bed and begin to pray. How? Just pray the Our Father. Use that as a model. And I've got lots of resources online at our website, casealaska.com. You can look at different messages on prayer and how to pray. But I've found the best thing. That's just listen to a message. Prayer is caught more than taught. The way I've learned how to break through in prayer and overcome in prayer and see release resources and miracles released in prayer is by I partnered with Dr. Morocco in prayer first and walked with him for years and still walking with him today. I've seen it model. I've seen miracles. I've seen too many miracles, too many breakthroughs to not even believe. I see it in the word, but I have practical experience of how to release miracles in prayer. Some of you are like, well, how do we do that? Come to morning prayer, 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. Pastor Kirsten will be leading. I'm going to be sleeping tomorrow. 
No, I'm in kidding. <laughs> come to prayer. I'm believing for a hundred people. Pastor Kirsten, come on up here. I'm believing for a hundred people to be in morning prayer during our fast. We have a fast that starts on January 3rd. So eat your bonbons, enjoy your sugar cookies, but get ready. Monday. Nehemiah's coming on Monday. No. You're going to share something in a second. It'll be all right. Give yourself to prayer. Can I share your story? All right, I'm going to share your story. I want you to hear this. A number, many years ago, Pastor Kirsten had a dream. And if you want to know why he's always on time and almost never not here for prayer, it's because of this dream. And in the dream, he's in a boat. And it's just him in the boat. There's a sail, and he's out at sea. And he sees this horrible sea monster come up and try to grab him. And he starts praying, oh, God! I don't, I don't know how that went, something like that. And he prayed, and the wind blew, and his sail filled with wind, and the boat lunged ahead out of harm's way. And he kept praying, oh, God! Oh, Lord, intervene! Oh, God, thank you! Oh, and I mean, just <laughs> sailboat. And he just chilled. He stopped praying. It's like. And there's that sea monster again. Comes up and over and tries to maul him. So he starts praying again. And guess what happened? Wind again. Filled his sail. Moved his boat. I think that happened three times. And I can't remember the exact quote from Pastor Kirsten. But the idea was, if you pray and the wind of God will be in your life, and the enemy will be bound, and you'll be moving on to the new territory in the kingdom. But if you don't have a prayer life, then you're gonna be lunch for the enemy. And you know how you know dreams are really from the Lord? One of the ways you know, you see a changed life. He's just never missed prayer since he had that. He's just always in prayer. I've seen so many miracles. Give yourself to prayer. Prayer is caught more than taught. We stream ours. I half think that maybe we shouldn't, but. We want to allow for varying schedules and people to be on. But if you could be here, you should be. Get here. He said, well, I'm tired. You're too tired not to pray. He said, well, I'm driving to Anchorage. Okay, drive to Anchorage. It's awesome. Go to work. Work is good. We talked about that earlier in the service. Work is sacred. Get a job. Remember? Work. Absolutely. But, but pray. Have a time. We set aside time. We say, I'm getting up right here. When do you get up? When, when is your... I want to know... This is rhetorical, which means don't yell it out or raise your hand. When is your prayer time? When, when it actually is the time that you get up and pray and talk? Listen, if Jesus, fully God, fully man, theologians say he spent six hours in prayer. So when is, when is your prayer time? The apostle Paul, day and night he prayed. Jesus prayed before events, after events. He prayed all night before he picked his disciples. Some of you pick employees within 30 seconds and you wonder why you have problems. I'm going over here. I'm going over here. How many of you know you should pray before you hire somebody? How many of you know you should pray before you make a big business decision? How about fasting and prayer? When are you praying? Answer that question before the Lord. Husbands and wives, when do you pray? I told my wife long ago, if I'm ever not going to prayer, there's going to be a problem. Remember? I go. And there are times I'm exhausted and the Lord wants me to rest. And there's nothing about nothing wrong with that either. But you must have a lifestyle of prayer. It must become the very fabric of your life. That's, this is actually what this whole thing is about. The house of God being a house of prayer. And the whole thing was destroyed because of unholy alliances, unequally yoked. They weren't tithing. They destroyed the whole thing. The, the, the reason we'll have a, an outpouring is if we pray and we do our part, then God will pour out His Spirit upon us. Can you say amen? Can you say a better amen? Be a person of prayer. Be a Nehemiah. Be a Nehemiah. Last point. Be a Nehemiah. What does that mean? He gave his life to seeing restoration, to see things confronted that were wrong. And I know it's the Old Testament. Don't go pulling people's hair. Don't go striking people, okay? But be a, be a man, be a woman of 
conviction. What are, I've got convictions. I don't alter them. I'm not, I'm not caving in on those. I'm going to keep them. I've got convictions that are birthed out of the Word of God. And I've made a commitment to my wife and especially to the Lord and to my children. I'm going to keep them. You're not going to read about me. And if you do read something, it's not true. We're all able to, we're, everyone here is able to fall, including me. I understand that. But if you stay on your knees and you live accountable and you follow the word and you repent, you keep a short list and you walk humbly before God and you stay transparent, then you will finish. I will tell you, I'm going to finish. I don't know about you. I want to finish my race. And then we're going to pass the baton should the Lord tarry. Thanks for listening to this message today. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and you realize that you need Jesus as your Savior and you'd like to pray with me to either commit your life to Jesus for the first time or rededicate your life to the Lord, repeat this prayer after me. Father God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for my sins. Jesus, thank you for dying for me and bringing me forgiveness. I'm sorry for my sins. I repent of them today and I ask you to cleanse me and wash me of all my sin. I commit to live for you all the rest of the days of my life. And I pray this in your name, Jesus, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, would you text the word SAVED to 907-357-2065? We'd like to send you some information and some materials that will help you in your Christian walk. God bless.